Yes, was there not? There was yeah. not. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Nobody contacted me. So I guess you will have a test this weekend. Hmm. Okay. Um, no, it's not. There was supposed to be, I must have had a, nobody reached out to me. So you guys should know the routine. I guess you guys were okay with not having one, but uh, maybe because of the midterm, some of you thought that. Fair enough. Uh, so it's going to be good night. But you can get in and do it tonight. Not the midterm. It's just a test that you should have taken Sunday. So I'm just catching up for uh, what should have been on there. So, okay, it's the money, the money stuff. We, we finished that on Wednesday. So I apologize. I'll look on my econ lab, but I'll give you a couple of days so I won't make it do tonight. But uh, you need to get on and do that because part of your midterm covers that section too. So. So next time, if you see something awry, just shoot me an email. I could have easily, I, I'm guessing I just didn't have a button flipped, apparently, which is weird. I don't know how that would have gotten off, but, okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, so as part of the review from that, I wanted to talk a little bit on a couple things with inflation. So... <clears throat> So this kind of ties into our, our next one coming up, uh, which is on currency. So let me write a couple of that, that stuff down so you guys can make sure you got that. So, uh, mod for test due Tuesday midnight at 11.59. As usual. So the homework was open though? Yeah. So you did the homework, just the test didn't show. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that should have been on for yesterday. So now you just had a little breather, I guess, for the for the thing. So you can get on and do it tonight. I'll flip the switch as soon as we're done with class. So you can work on it anytime and get on that. So that that is just mod four only. And then um, the midterm is Wednesday in class and I'll be sending out so you guys got a lot of econ ahead of you here I'll be sending out the, your practice test and then when was Joe going to meet was that tomorrow yeah. tomorrow night yeah so Tuesday and I think we went with 8 p.m. right <laughs> is the review session which will be in this room Okay, um, ba, 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 ba. so that'll be our whole class, by the way, so we won't have any other class. You'll just come to class to take the test. The test probably won't take um, uh, too long. It usually doesn't take anybody more than an hour, so we'll uh, get started on that. That'll be a little bit of extra free time. Uh, I feel like I'm missing something else. Mind for test, midterm. What else was I right? Oh, the video. Now this, I would just wait then. If you guys got enough on your plate, there's nothing wrong with take, watching this video that you missed on Friday if you didn't take it. I know some of you did. But uh, so mod five video lecture uh, due Thursday night. <clears throat> So this is mod five, so I don't even want you thinking about it, honestly. You got enough on your plate for uh, between now and Wednesday for the test. So let's say that's due uh, Thursday night. Uh, go to the announcement. It should be in your email inbox too somewhere. It might be in your spam, but announcement uh, in Blackboard. So it's permanently in Blackboard if you go to the announcements. It'll bring you right to the what you need to see. But it'll bring be a on rocks on YouTube. And the midterm practice test will be on my phone. Uh, no, I'll be sending that out. Okay. So yeah, that'll be sent out here uh, probably after class. So I got a couple things after class. So midterm practice test sent after class. Sent shortly. Send shortly. Okay. <laughs> anything else? 
Okay, so I'm um, going to share some of the stuff I did. Uh, it was, it was kind of good timing for where we're at in the class. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit on uh, Cuba, the presentation that I, I was at the Federal Reserve, uh, uh, the Federal Reserve of Atlanta, Miami branch is where our meeting was Thursday night. And there was a, a guy who works for the Fed that presented some information on Cuba that I'm going to share a little bit of. His slides was kind of interesting. Um, and then I uh, want to bring up a couple inflation things. So Zimbabwe is a country that has had some hyperinflation. The Zimbabwe dollar was not worth as much as toilet paper at one point. Uh, a piece of toilet paper, not even a roll of toilet paper. Um, so I wanted to kind of motivate some of what we're getting into today and tie it back to inflation. Uh, let's see, Zimbabwe, where are you? Uh, I thought I had it highlighted in yellow. There we go. So what we did in <clears throat> the money chapter was explored what happens when countries start to use the printing press to pay for things. So Uncle Milty had that equation of exchange where nominal GDP equals the quantity of money times the velocity of money. So the price level times real GDP, price times quantity, the amount of stuff, the dollar value of stuff, like the $16 trillion worth of stuff that we have in the United States, had to be purchased with money, is the concept here. So money exchanges hands over time with, with velocity. So you had some homework problems that worked through that. And if the government's in control of the money supply, they often tend to go to the printing press when they need stuff. So they can actually print money in some cases. Is that true in the United States? Is Trump able to just order up some more money to buy some stuff? No. So in the United States and other uh, most developed countries uh, that are in that top quartile of the Economic Freedom Index have a more responsible situation with money because they know that governments tend to uh, not work so good if the money is kept with the president of the, of the country. And so if those two things are too tight, there ends up being problems, what we're going to see in this video uh, shortly. Um, so we have the independence of the Fed in the United States. So Janet Yellen calls all the shots with monetary policy. Trump, Congress, they, they can't influence her at all. She has complete autonomy in setting the agenda. Her, along with the other six members of the board of, of governors, end up calling the shots for monetary policy in the United States. And that's the way most central banks around the world uh, operate, is with this some degree of independence of the Federal Reserve or the central bank in their country and the fiscal policy of the government. So we're going to check out this video, kind of short video, to talk about how inflation worked in Zimbabwe here. One of the things that we uh, put together as uh, one of the strengths of our clients is a series of 27 official notes. These are this is currency from the country of Zimbabwe. And uh, take a look here. This starts out at $1 and the date on it, I don't know if you can zoom in and see that or not, but uh, in 2007, they had ones and then, of course, fives, tens, and twenties. And this was uh, the currency that was being used. Um, and uh, as we well know, what happened is the hyperinflation started to kick in. And, they started printing higher and higher denominations as people demanded more and more currency. And so they got up to the 500s and 1000s. We're still in 2007. Here in 2008, they started printing in the tens of thousands. So in 
facility in a period of uh, you know, less than one year, we went from ones, fives, and tens all the way up to tens and twenty thousands. Started looking up here at fifty thousand, hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, or one million dollar bills, and it just kept going and going and going. Uh, let me show you over here. We get the billions, one and five and ten and twenty. And then here's a fifty billion dollar bill on July fourth, two thousand eight. A camp coat would have cost you fifty billion dollars for breakfast, but at lunchtime it would be a hundred billion, and by the time you get there, it would be hundred fifty billion dollars. Their inflation rate, as you know, is approximately 10 to 27 power. And it's something that's just staggering. And uh, by the time they started printing, uh, they just said, well, forget the, the billions, let's just go to the trillions. So they started printing 10, 20, 1500 trillion dollar notes. Uh, they hired a German company to, uh, to print these. And they placed the orders for these. And by the time the German com company was finished actually printing them, uh, they weren't worth the paper and the ink that it took to make them. So the German company never delivered them, they were never circulated. So these are, um, these are all uncirculated uh, banknotes, but it illustrates how fast, how quickly, and how devastating hyperinflation can be. From 2007 to 2008, in a period of less than two years, about one and a half years, uh, the currency imploded, and now they don't even have national currency as a problem. They have these hard currencies, gold, and silver. Quite a lesson, Nolan. I hope you know when you learn this is that lesson. Thank you so much for your Thank you. My real. Yes, real. All right. So, questions on that video? Kind of insane, huh? A hundred trillion dollar bill. So, all of that kind of comes back to this equation that the government was just printing off this. Right? So they needed to buy something. They said, oh, well, it's around 50 trillion. Okay, here's a 50 trillion dollar bill. Literally, over time, it kind of, and it has so kind of amazing. So when this is increasing by 100%, this increases by 100% is what the quantity theory of money that Milton Friedman brought to the table said. So real GDP is based on real resources, right? Land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, uh, the level of technology. That's what determines our quantities of stuff. And so prices have this connection to money. All right, so here is something that was sent to me by um, an actual former professor of mine at Iowa State that was then a colleague of mine. And he sent this in an email. I think he was the chair of the department at this point. So this was in. February 4th of 2009, this is literally the email of the report that he sent me. And this is um, what we saw in the video in terms of the rate of inflation. So it's already being calculated monthly, notice. So on January 5th of 07, the inflation rate was 13%. Well, pretty high, but you know, at least a number we can grapple with. And then October, 165%. 193%. This is where it gets fun. Three thousand. This is the monthly inflation rate. Forty-five thousand percent. Whatever that number is, percent, right? So that's where they're printing off, and that that's manifesting itself in that currency at the same time. So at the same time these things are going on, the government's actually printing off bills that match that because that's what it costs for the can of Coke, is that kind of money. Um, so questions or comments there? So at the end of the video, they said that the currency kind of collapsed. What did he say that it went to? Gold and silver. So that was part of it. Now that guy was trying to sell gold and silver. So that's part of where that I just like his video. Uh, so I use it. Um, but he also said something else about hard currency. And so what countries tend to do is they'll use another country's currency because there's nothing necessarily illegal. With, well, actually, sometimes that can be banned by the government. But at least in the black market, things that would, like the real trading that goes on, they would be trading in dollars. And as long as the police don't catch them, if it is against the law, 
um, then it's no big deal. Otherwise, the government might come to their senses and say, we're screwed. I mean, our currency is worthless. So let's just, it's okay to use the American dollar or the euro. Uh, so they use other countries' currencies. And notice what that does then is it takes it out of the government's hand, right? It almost creates that independence that we already have in the United States through the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank, and uh, the President and Congress. By using another country's currency, assuming that they stay stable, then whatever dollars are floating around, like literal American dollars that are floating around, then that is good money. And it's going to uh, kind of keep its value because the government won't be doing any monkey business. They can't because they obviously can't tell the United States what to do with their currency. Okay. All right. So that ends up being a, one of the things that comes up in this chapter is with the currency regime. Um, so the next thing I wanted to share with you is just how uh, this quantity theory of money doesn't always work the way the textbook um, says. And Jim Gortney, the Ottawa University alumni that, that we're trying to start the Gortney Institute with here on campus was at this conference. In fact, is Florida State is who was hosting this, this conference that I went to. And he spoke about this um, is one of the last speakers of the day on how Uncle Milty's formula isn't quite working as much with um, uh, the, the central bank today. So I have kind of a related story that I did. I went to another kind of teaching workshop thing back on uh, October of 2008. So the financial crisis was just starting in 2008. So in the fall of 2008, kind of the crap started hitting the fan, so to speak, is when, when that started to happen with the, with the financial crisis. And so Michael Parkin, who's the author of your textbook, was giving a lunchtime presentation to us and kind of discussing, obviously, the financial crisis was the big, was the big talk. So uh, um, I emailed him after that. Because one thing stuck. So I said, uh, Michael, one thing that stuck with me during your lunch talk uh, was the change in the composition of the Fed's assets. I'm not knowledgeable with the details of the Fed, but Fed, but I would guess that they do not charge off, quote unquote, bad assets very often, since they normally hold all U.S. government securities. Right? We talked about the buying and selling of government bonds, the open market operations. With bad assets in the Fed portfolio, is the government potentially running the printing press, quote unquote, that we're talking about the United States government, right? In a discreet way. This practice will definitely lead to paying for the bailout through higher prices as well as taxes, will it not? So that's what I threw at him. And so normally we do the open market operations under normal circumstances and we, uh, you know, did something like this where the Addy owns a bond that was sold by the U.S. You can hold on to it this time, Addy. So Addy owns the government bond, and I, Janet Yellen, central banker, goes in to stimulate the economy, to do an expansionary monetary policy, right? So I can do an open market purchase of the bond. So I go into the system and put in some money, and now I'm holding the bond. Well, what happened during the financial crisis is that the Federal Reserve started buying things other than government bonds. The bond that they bought were sometimes corporate bonds and other assets that were really shaky on default. So in other words, there was a lot of risk with this bond, but I was trying to help out the bank. So the bank bailout during the financial crisis. You guys heard about the government kind of bailing out Wall Street type of stuff? Well, what happened is that the bank was holding this piece of crap. So Addie, the Wall Street banker she is, had a piece of junk asset that was likely to default. Worse yet, people were pulling some of the money out of the bank of Addie and didn't look like they were gonna pay it back. And so government steps in and says, I got a solution, Addie, don't worry about it. I got your back. I'll take this piece of crap off your balance sheet. There's some money. 
go pay your bills and, and don't shut down, don't go bankrupt. You see how I did that? I kind of bailed her out, right? I took something that didn't have any market value because nobody was buying this stuff during the financial uh, crisis. Now, in fairness to the Fed, I mean, that's part of what the Fed does is it provides liquidity during a crisis like that to hopefully offset it. And so economists debate whether that bailout was truly needed, was that the best way to go about it or not? But my question to Michael here was that normally the, the Fed homes government bonds and the, the U.S. government hasn't defaulted on their bonds. But if the Fed is holding a piece of crap right now and the piece of crap does what piece of craps do sometime and default, then this kind of goes over here, right? Into the garbage can. And what happened to the supply of money? Did it go up or down? Up, and it went up permanently. It was kind of like running the printing press in a discreet way, right? Really, all Janet did was buy a piece of crap that belonged in the garbage can, put money into the system. Fundamentally, it wasn't really much different than running the printing press. That's what, what my question was to him. So if there was defaults on this stuff, that would be the result. Because otherwise, what happens is Janet holds on to this thing, the government pays their bills back, and ultimately pays the one million back for the money. The money's kind of always just being processed through the system. So fundamental difference <clears throat> when we have that happen. All right, questions or comments there? Here is our author's response back to me. Russ, I enjoyed our conversations last week. I think we are heading towards the printing press. The Fed's balance sheet is in the table below. Between September 2007 and September 2008, the monetary base, total liabilities, increased 14.1%. Definitely inflationary if sustained. Look at the drop in safe government securities and the rise in loans to banks and other sometimes toxic securities, those are the garbage can securities, up from 30 billion to 446 billion and US government securities down from 780 to 480. Cheers. He's, a, he's actually Canadian, by the way. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah he's, uh, <laughs> so he's got, that's where the cheers came from. He's got cheers. kind of some of that uh, little dialogue going. So here's the balance sheet from the Fed. So pre-crisis, right, before the financial crisis, most of what the government owned was indeed US government securities. 780 million loans to other banks, like discount loans if the bank was in trouble, the banker's bank, all that stuff we talked about. A very small fraction of that was here. And then if we go to September 2008, loans to banks, there's the bailout, right? And if those turn out to be garbage, that'll be like running the printing press. All right, so um, myself, Michael Parkin, Jim Gortney, as he announced during the talk this week, we all, you know, you didn't have to be much of a principles of macroeconomics professor to predict that we should be seeing some inflation. There hasn't been any inflation. You know, so what, what the heck happened? How could we be so wrong? What Jim Gortney said uh, was uh, apparently Uncle Milty, uh, Milton Friedman, at one point said that the timing of the inflation will be long and variable. So Jim's kind of comment was, well, Uncle Melty didn't tell us it was going to be 10 years, right? He was getting long and variable would usually mean, I don't know, two to three to four years. I mean, we've all been kind of hanging on to this prediction. Again, my emails dated when I predicted it was 2008. Well, we still haven't seen it. What year are we in? 2017. So Something's not quite right with this. And so um, what, what's happening is that the banks are not loaning out all of those excess reserves, right? So when Stephanie put in her $10,000 into TD Bank and there was a 20% required reserve ratio, TD Bank loaned out 8,000 to Andrew, right? Loaned out all of the excess reserves. But if banks are being kind of cautious because they got burned during the financial crisis, they are choosing to not loan out that amount. 
And likewise, consumers and savers might be starting to kind of hoard their cash. And cash is king during the financial crisis. So if that money is not out in circulation, long story short, then this isn't gonna happen. Even though the Fed has increased the money supply, uh, Federal Reserve notes up, even though they've increased the money supply, we're not going to get the impact on inflation if that money's just being held within banks. Does that make sense? So this formula was based upon kind of normal behavior of of that money out. And so that can be traced back to velocity. Basically, velocity has gone down. The number of times that a dollar is getting spent and that it's actually not getting out into the system. And this is true of corporations hoarding cash, consumers hoarding cash. Everybody's kind of holding on to their cash and it's not getting out into the system the way it, the, the way it does under normal circumstances. Okay, comments or questions there? That helped gel a few things together after your homework with a little quantity theory. All right. Um, let's see. Is it time to talk about Big Macs yet? Um, hope you guys aren't hungry. We're going to talk about Big Macs today. Yeah, let's uh, let's do that one next. All right, uh, let me get this thing teed up, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more first. So, there's this. All right, so I think I need to cue you up a little bit here. So, let's get a few notes down and then we'll hit to the, hit to the video. Um, so, with international currency, um, we've got two markets really going on. There's the trade for goods and services. Uh, us, you know, the Chinese buying chopsticks from us. I think I mentioned that before that we're a, we're an ex, a net exporter for chopsticks to China. It's always kind of surprised me as being funny. Um, but in your, your, uh, sheets here. When we think about the rest of the world, the big plate of spaghetti, we brought in the rest of the world for exchanging for imports and exports. Well, this sheet kind of explains the double market that we have that we're introducing in this week's material, and that's the foreign exchange market. So we have the goods that we're trading, but they don't use dollars. So U.S. currency is not money in China, right? Just like the Chinese yuan is their currency is not money when you're in the United States. So money is anything that's generally accepted as a means of payment as we, as we defined uh, last week. And so we need to do a little swap of currency uh, between each other so that when I buy the Chinese good, they have yuan or vice versa, uh, I have dollars to use since we're living in those markets. Okay, so um, the concept that we started in the video, by the way, this video is kind of towards the end of the video, uh, if you haven't watched it yet, uh, I get into what I'm doing today. You can't really see the video on the screen, so this will kind of cover that. Um, but it gets into what economists call purchasing power parity. PPP. Purchasing power parity. And basically, 
identical goods in each country should sell for the same price. Otherwise, there might be a profit opportunity. So identical goods, identical goods in different countries Identical goods in different countries will cost the same after exchanging So, for example, uh, actually, let me put this formula up first. The price of a car in the United States should equal the price of a car in Japan. So, remember our notation where we've got the foreign country with the, the rest of the world or the foreign country with a little star? So we're talking about the price of a car, and maybe let's be specific, this would be like a Toyota Prius or something. Same model, same everything. The price of a car in Japan should be equal to the dollar price of that car converted for the exchange rate. So applying the exchange rate, should get us to the same to the same place. What's the exchange rate? So the exchange rate, and this is all in the video, so I'm just doing kind of a quick review to kind of tee up this, this stuff. So make sure you get to that video by Thursday. So the exchange rate is one currency expressed in terms of another. So for example, if 100 yen, if 100 yen equals $1, Then the exchange rate E equals 100 yen per dollar. So E is the exchange rate saying that you can exchange 100 yen for every dollar. So this is where we're going to start to use this kind of goofy notation where I'll, I'll try to put like the words dollar after it rather than the way we normally write it like, oh, that thing cost me a buck 56. I'm going to say $1.56 per uh, item, whatever, per unit of X. So we're going to start to use that because that helps keep the numbers straight for calculating exchanges. So putting this formula or to, to use here, so if a Toyota Prius runs um, $32,000, just to pick a price, so suppose the price of the Prius in the United States is $32,000 per Prius. I guess I'm using car, so let me put PC. Dollars per car. You'll know, even write out car. How much does that Prius, how much should that Prius run us in Japan? So use this formula. I'll walk around the room. I'll see you guys writing some, down, some, some stuff on paper here. We've got the exchange rate, 100 yen per dollar. And we've got a $32,000 Prius in the United States. So set up the formula. Don't just calculate it. I want to kind of see the formula laid out. 
You're solving for P star car, right? That's the price of the Prius in Japan. Price of the Prius in Japan. So start your equation off with PC star, or price of car star equals, and then let's just plug each up. It's kind of not equals, but then use our numbers. What you guys get for an answer? Anybody got it yet? Three million two hundred thousand. Three hundred. Three million two hundred thousand yen. Right. So the price tag on the showroom. I'm gonna still walk around and help you guys. I want to see. I want to see you write that formula because that's what you're gonna to need to do on test day. So PC equals PC star equals one hundred times thirty-two thousand. Should give you, as Amanda calculated, 3.2 million yen. A lot of zeros. Starting to resemble Zimbabwe, right? We got 3.2 million yen. <laughs> All right, so. Price of the Prius in Japan equals, now watch how I do it, because a lot of you didn't do it this way. 100, some of you did, which is good. 100 yen per dollar times 32,000 dollars per car. Why is it convenient to write it out that way? And then we can, let me cut to the chase for Amanda's answer is 100 times 32, I like that. 100 times 32,000 is the 3.2 million. But why does this work out nice? Yeah, you cancel out the dollars. So using this will kind of help keep the number straight. Even if you're doing a multiple choice problem or something on your homework, you can kind of pull out a side note. The dollars cancel which tells you that you've just calculated how many yen per car, right? So now we've got yen per car that we've converted to. All right, so purchasing power parity claims that identical goods in different countries will cost the same after exchanging the currency. In other words, we should see this happening. Now, what if, um, <clears throat> what if we, looked in Japan and found uh, cars at about three million. So let, let's just say that purchasing power parity, purchasing power parity, PPP, predicts that this should be the price of a car. What kind of behavior might go on by a profit-minded person if indeed in Japan the Prius had a price tag of three million yen? Good, right? So economists call that arbitrage. Arbitrage. Pure arbitrage is buying other without any risk. The, the risk part, because we all buy low, sell high, but usually you take on risk. In this case, we know that the market price of a Prius, just kind of pretend that there's a real strong market for Priuses in the United States. You can sell them for 32,000 bucks all day long, right? Put up a ad on Craigslist, it's gone, 32,000, right? So we have a real active fluid market, which isn't the best example of cars, by the way, but uh, we have a fairly active market where the equilibrium price of 32,000, you can sell that pretty easily all day long in the United States. It sets up this arbitrage opportunity for the person who has knowledge of Japanese prices to buy the car in Japan, bring it over to the United States, and resell it at a profit. Now, as that activity starts to go on, what's going to happen to the exchange rate? Well, this is where it helps to have a little knowledge from the video I gave you last, or that's, that's up, but as that activity goes on, what's going to happen to the exchange rate? 
is the yen gonna appreciate or depreciate as more and more people try to make money on this arbitrage deal, this profit opportunity? Decrease, increase. So again, without working through the video, that's, that's something that you're gonna have to try to tackle. If this goes up to 110, did the yen appreciate or depreciate? Depreciate. This is where it gets a little weird sometimes. So what happened to the dollar? If this is 110, did the dollar appreciate or depreciate? Appreciate. Okay, so that one's usually, so this is how many yen per dollar. You can just think of yourself as American and say, gosh, if I went to the foreign exchange market, I'd prefer to have more yen the better. So if I give up one of my... American dollars, what would I rather have, 100 yen or 110 yen? Well, I'd always take more as preferred to less. That means you're going to have more power. So if this goes up to 110, your dollar has appreciated in terms of its purchasing power around the globe, right? So we have appreciation of the dollar if this number goes up. But since it's yen for dollar, if the dollar goes up, that means the yen's going down. Right, so what happens to one currency happens to the other. All right, so that's the market, that's the foreign exchange market that uh, uh, I set up, I think, pretty nicely for you in the video. And that, that's what you're going to need to know for, for monitoring the foreign exchange market. So we have the demand for dollars the supply of dollars, and we're measuring the exchange rate, which is yen per dollar. Some people want to buy uh, dollars. Some people want to sell dollars. So we got buyers and sellers of the currency, depending on what you're holding. By the way, a lot of places hold both. So if you're a big global corporation, you've got yen and dollars at the same time. So depending on what, what type of business is going on and maybe what exchange rates, you're gonna be holding both. So this is our depiction of the foreign exchange market. The foreign exchange market shows the price of dollars globally. One dollar will sell for a hundred yen. The exchange rate is the vertical axis, and it shows yen per dollar. How many yen does it take to get one dollar? A hundred. All right, so. That'll be how things start to move if there's arbitrage opportunities. The car isn't the best example of this because you got some other things with transportation. Um, but I think your textbook, I don't know if you still, still doing this or not, but your textbook had a good mix. Uh, you know, when, this is a four gig. They're so cheap now. I mean, this thing used to probably be $100 at one point, but how much can you buy four gigs for? Now you can buy a terabyte or four terabytes for probably $100, but uh, what do we pick these up for now? I haven't shopped them for a while. Five bucks? Huh? Five bucks. So we can pick these up for five bucks. So these are pretty lightweight, easy to ship, even globally. So if there's one of these opportunities around the globe, people could easily buy in Japan and have them ship to the United States and make money on it, right? So those profit opportunities through competition, through the global marketplace, those tend to be squeezed out because we have lots of people that are looking for profit opportunities, right? Everybody wants to turn a buck, typically, or at least at some point in their life. And so they're going, we're going to be seeking that at all the time. And so because that's the case, it brings us to purchasing power parity. Identical goods around the globe should sell for the same price after you adjust for the exchange rate. 
if there's a profit opportunity, then supply and demand is going to adjust so that that profit opportunity disappears. Make sense? Okay, so um, McDonald's is kind of an interesting case. If you didn't know, McDonald's is around the globe. And so a long time ago, uh, The Economist magazine uh, did a Big Mac index, and they were comparing Big Mac prices around the globe. And so purchasing power parity makes this prediction that after adjusting for exchange, Big Mac should be priced the same all around the world. If not, there's a profit opportunity, right? So you can kind of use a Big Mac as a comparison for different currencies around the globe. So this video is going to start us off, and then we're going to go to the, to the website to look at the Big Mac index. Let me get this one going. McDonald's is everywhere. In the contiguous United States, the farthest you can get away from one is a spot in the Sheldon National Angel of Refuge at the bottom. Even then, you only have to drive 150 miles to the nearest coal merchants. Around the world, there are more than 36,000 locations in 119 different countries. One of the defining characteristics of McDonald's is the commitment to consistency across the brand. While there are regional differences to the menu, such as kiwi burgers in New Zealand or chicken congee in Indonesia, the core menu items such as Big Macs, chicken nuggets, and fries are possible. That means that the same items are being made in the same way with the same ingredients in very different economies around the world. Obviously, Big Macs don't cost the same everywhere. A Big Mac costs on average four seventy nine in the U.S. So if you're to charge the equivalent in Kenya, four hundred and eighty shilling. Nobody would buy it because that's double the average daily salary. That'd be like charging $200 for a Big Mac in the U.S. That's why McDonald's sets the local price for burgers based on a variety of factors such as labor costs, rent, and ingredient costs, and local incomes. Now for some real economics. Purchasing power is the amount of goods you can get from one unit of currency. Let me explain. In the U.S., the average price of a Big Mac across all markets is $4.79. In Sweden, the cost of a Big Mac is 44 krona. 44 krona is equivalent to $5.13. That means that in the U.S., you can get 20.8% of a Big Mac for a dollar, while in Sweden, you can only get 19.5% of that burger. So in terms of the Big Mac, the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar is higher. You get more than for your buck. This also means that the Swedish krona is overvalued in terms of exchange rates by about 6.1% at least according to the Big Mac Index. The Economist magazine first created the index in 1986 as an informal way of comparing purchasing power between currencies. So now let's look at the numbers. In Venezuela, the cost of a Big Mac is equivalent to 66 cents. That's the cheapest Big Mac in terms of equivalent U.S. dollars in the world. This is largely due to recent currency devaluations and high inflation in the country. It's possible that the cost of the Venezuelan Big Mac will soon rise in response. This means that for the cost of one American Big Mac, you could buy seven Venezuelan Big Macs. After Venezuela, the countries with the cheapest Big Macs are Russia, Ukraine, South Africa, and Indonesia. For the other side of the spectrum, the top five most expensive Big Macs come from Switzerland, Sweden, Norway, the U.S., and Denmark. That's right, the U.S. is home to the fourth most expensive Big Mac in the world. What's also interesting is to look at how long it takes individuals to earn enough money to buy a Big Mac in different cities around the world. In Nairobi, Kenya, an average worker would have to rack up 173 minutes on the clock to get for one Big Mac. Compare that to a worker in Hong Kong who would only have to work for 8.7 minutes for a burger. The quickest one can earn a burger in the U.S. is in Miami, where the average individual would only have to work for 10.7 minutes to pay for a Big Mac. Now, this index isn't perfect. While the cost of ingredients is pretty similar across all countries since all ingredients are held in the same standard, the index doesn't account for the wide differences in labor and land costs. A burger will cost less to make in India because McDonald's doesn't need to pay as much for employees in retail space. Nevertheless, this is a great way of teaching some basic economics in a tasty way. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Last week I covered timekeeping on Mars. Okay, so questions there.
So we got some issues going on, right? So what were some of the differences in countries that would reflect the price? Labor, right? So labor cost is one, what let us just mention. Ingredients cost, yes, and but there's also consistency in shipping, so that one's probably less. But you might be shipping to get up to the but land and real estate. We're bigger drivers. But all of that's possible underlying fundamentals of why they would why they would differ. Um, and so the index is helpful for some things and maybe not for others. And they readily admit there's issues with it, especially when we start talking about arbitrage and making money on a Big Mac. How easy is it to uh, buy a Big Mac in a different country and then resell it in the United States or whatever? What issues are we going to run into? Yeah, it was bad, just spoilage, right? So, so some goods, the thumb drive is conducive to that, right? It's very durable and it'll last through shipping. Other goods like produce and food and other things, the shelf life is going to be an issue. But t-shirts have good shelf life, right? So Super Bowl champions, New England Patriots, fifth time in a row. I was going for Atlanta yesterday. Uh, but just because I wanted the underdog to get one, I you know, we talked about, this is more of a micro thing, but the law of diminishing marginal utility. You know, how, how does Brady's fifth ring compare to the first ring and the second ring and the third ring, right? So we got that law of diminishing returns that we talked about in this class. So I thought the, the value to Atlanta, uh, the, the, the city of Atlanta and all of that, that, that I, I thought society would be better well served by an Atlanta win as opposed to New England. I was thinking about those social issues like I like to do. Uh, so there's some good economic theory to suggest that society would have been better off with an Atlanta victory yesterday. It's, it's kind of the long and the short of it. So, uh, was anybody going for New England? Oh, geez, we got lots of New Englanders. All right, well, not lots. I guess we're, we're up to five. So uh, there's a part of them. For one thing, I didn't really have much of a dog in the hunt. So I, I usually like to root for whoever's behind. But I even found myself yesterday, like I just knew if the pendulum started to swing, I mean, Brady started just being on the money. He, would, he looked, he did not look good that first part. So all of a sudden you saw things clicking and kind of a miracle that they pulled it off. But all right, so uh, what, what I hear, cheaters. Yeah, that's, I, that's what I usually think about with Belichick too. So uh, I, I suppose he's probably a good coach. He doesn't cheat all the time, I suppose. What's that? National hero. National hero. Is he Canadian? Oh, I thought you were saying that because there was a Canadian tie. <laughs> All right, so here is our index. They've really beefed this thing up over time. It's kind of crazy. So uh, let me try to enlarge it a little bit. There is, there is some you know important stuff from this chapter that goes on. So this is not just for fun. Um, you guys might need to know some of this for, for a test even. So, um, uh oh, this is my interactive. Why is it not interacting with me? I'll try to reload this thing. Well, maybe it's our slow internet. Let's, uh, oh, there, wait, it's coming. There we go. I think it's just loading very slowly with our awesome internet here. All right, so let me start down here because the, the, all of this kind of highlights when you put the cursor over it and it tells you data about Big Mac prices around the world. So this is Big Mac prices versus GDP per person. So we talked about income per person, right? And so what are the, how does Big Mac prices and GDP per person? So the richer countries have higher prices and higher GDP. So here we have a Big Mac price of $6.35 in Switzerland. Funny, I just talked to some people from um, Switzerland uh, when I was in Miami. They, uh, they were asking, I, I was sitting down eating a burger actually, <laughs> and uh, they said, excuse me, what is the service charge or how do the taxes work here? 
And so then I could tell from their accents, and they said they were from Switzerland and visiting. Because we knew prices would be expensive. By the way, prices are expensive in Miami, um, if you didn't know that. And the taxes, for one thing, are they were over 10% or around 10%. But then they said, what's a, the service charge? Are we supposed to tip? They were wondering about how to tip. And so uh, this was on South Beach. So right on the tourist area, Ocean Drive, of this restaurant I was at. And it learned, uh, I saw from another place too that they put the service charge of 18% automatically right on top. Whether you know how when you go to places he around here, if you go to Kansas City or even maybe in Ottawa, if you have a party of eight, a table of eight that they'll kind of roll gratuity into it. Well, here it didn't matter. Anything you order, whether it was just a single drink or a plate of food or anything, it was an automatic 18% added on to it. So I told them, no, you don't have to tip. The tip's already included is what I told them. But, um, you know, if you want to put a little extra on, you can. But I'm not doing that for the most part. I, I, that's not true. There was one... Uh, server that was really good in Buster and Tail. So I, I threw a couple bucks on top of the 18% to her because uh, uh, she was pretty awesome. But um, so that was our Switzerland story. So GDP per person, I didn't realize they were so rich. Actually, I kind of forgot where it was at. Here's current data. So this thing's being updated all the time. $80,000 per person in Switzerland. So that's income per person on average is 80,000, that's higher than the United States. Now they have a lot smaller population. Their Big Mac is running 635. In the United States, that video showed 479, but apparently there's been some inflation. Um, I didn't check, I kind of meant to, when, when was that video made? April 26th of 2016, so not even a year ago, wow. Huh. So they said it was 479, maybe it was filmed earlier than that. But in the United States, we've got, where did my United States go? There it is, $5.06, GDP per person, $55,805. So then we kind of go down the line and see what the Big Mac costs in different countries, and that's going on over here with these numbers as well. Uh, which aren't hi highlighting for me, but here is India, uh, $2.49, Pakistan, $3.58, Brazil, $5.12, and their GDP per person is uh, $8,600. Remember when we did the country comparison? So income per person down in, I, I, I said in the Central and South America, we were sometimes in, or a lot of them are in that $8,000 to um, $18,000 range for a lot of Central and South America. So here we got Brazil at $8,600 is the income per person there. Whereas again, the United States has $55,000 per person and Switzerland has $80,000 per person. All right, so we got South Korea, $3.68, Big Mac price, okay. So let me see if this thing's working here, dang it. What am I, am I in? What am I in here? Am I in Chrome? Yes, I am. Let me just out of curiosity. Let me. I'm having uh, internet issues around campus. Hop on or. This doesn't look much faster. As we wait for this to load, I want to give it one more try. I, I can move on. Oh, good. This is working. Okay. There we go. There's a little lesson to switch browsers when one seems to be struggling. Okay. So I'm going to zoom in on the map here. So now these bars light up. See this, this list over here? So we've got all the countries, and there's Canada, the Canadians in the room here. Uh, $4.51. So we've got uh, actual exchange rate. Does that sound about right? $1.33? So, um, and then we've got Mexico. Down in Mexico, $42.23. So that kind of possible arbitrage opportunity, right? Kind of like Canada, but you're not quite as populated right around the U.S. border. So we could go to 
Uh, let's see, we got some Texas people here. Uh, who is, uh, begins with an L, but I'm drawing a blank for some reason on the border town where Mexico is right, like give me some of those border towns that it, like Mexico's like, huh? Laredo. Laredo. Yeah, Laredo, Laredo, thank you. That's the one I was thinking of was Laredo. I met a guy when I was in Cancun once that uh, was a business guy that lived in Laredo, but popped across and did um, importing and exporting or whatever good he was, what he was selling. So Laredo. So in Laredo, if you've got a $2.23 Big Mac, uh, and you go right across the border, how long did, are you familiar with it? How long does it take you to go from, you know, to get across the border in Laredo to, to the United States? Like if you're, let's say, McDonald's in Mexico and then and head over to across the border. Anybody know that? Any of you Texas people? You know, right at the border town, there wouldn't be a McDonald's maybe there? No? Okay, maybe Tijuana would work. There might be a Mexico down there. That'd be another border crossing. All right, so the idea here for the arbitrage is what I want to think about. So right now, the peso has an exchange rate of 21.95. So 21.95 pesos to one American dollar is the exchange rate. Now, this next thing says that the implied exchange rate for the uh, uh, Big Mac, the Big Mac trade is nine dollars, or I'm sorry, nine point six eight pesos. So the purchasing power parity idea is claiming that the Mexican peso is undervalued by fifty five percent. Right? It's undervalued relative to what economic theory would predict it should be. Uh, to the tune of 55.9. Uh, okay, so let's see, where did I, did I forget to bring that post in there? No, that's okay, I can wing it, I think. But I did a little back of the, back of the notebook scratch paper somewhere, but that's all right, I can wing it. Let's go through a profit opportunity here. So um, go ahead and pull out your uh, phones, put it on airplane mode, please, and pull it, get your calculator function out, or just pull out a calculator if you've got a calculator. Let's work, let's work through some problems. And then along with your notebook paper, kind of figure out. So what, the first thing I want to do is think about the, the relative price of the bird in each place. So in Mexico, the dollar price is 223, which means you go run into the McDonald's in Mexico on the order menu, it says 49 pesos. Right? So a Mexican Big Mac is 49 pesos. So what I want to do is look at the relative price. We did this exercise before. I want to take the price of a Big Mac in Mexico divided by the price of the Big Mac in the United States. So we've got 49 pesos per Big Mac is the price of the Big Mac in Mexico, divided by five dollars and, what was it again, six cents? Uh, yeah, five dollars and six cents is the price in the United States. I'm going to go back over to Mexico here. So $5.06 dollars per Big Mac in the United States. And so with your calculators, what's 49 divided by 5.06? 9.68. And now we've got this math the way I like to do it here, because when we got a fraction, when we have a fraction in the denominator, our trick with math is to flip it over and multiply it times the numerator, right? So we get BM time or BM over dollars. And so BM now cancels out the Big Mac. And what are we left with? 9.68 pesos per dollar. So in terms of Big Mac for Big Mac, the exchange rate of Big Mac for Big Mac 
is 9.68. That's what this number is giving us on the Big Mac index. So the implied exchange rate is 9.68. That means there might be an arbitrage opportunity, a profit opportunity. So how are we going to make money on Big Macs? Well, let's say we're an American and we've got $100. So let's call this arbitrage, arbitrage with Big Macs. Step number one, take your $100. I want to use my notation the way I want. Take my $100 and convert it into pesos. So if I have $100, how many pesos am I going to get? 49, I have $100, 49, the exchange rate is 21.95, 21.95 pesos per dollar is the actual exchange rate. How much do I got? 2,195, right? You bring $100, every dollar is going to get you 21.95. So again, on your calculators, what you're doing is let me go ahead and just say, say that we get to the 2195 pesos. How did we do it? We took our hundred dollars times the exchange rate of 21.95 pesos for every dollar. The dollars cancel. 100 times 2195 gives me 2195 pesos. And see how it's kind of nice that it keeps track of the notation for us. Keeps our brain straight, hopefully, if we get any line. All right, everybody with me there? So now here we are sitting with 2,195 pesos. What do I do next? So buy Big Mac. So, yeah, Ashley, you were starting to do the math already. What were you doing? Just in general, dividing what by what? How much it costs a Big Mac, right? So number two, we need to go buy some Big Macs. So I'm going to take, I've got 2,100 in, so buy Big Macs with our pesos. This is our next step. So I'm going to take my 1,195 pesos, and how many Big Macs can I buy? What's my quantity of, of Big Macs? 2,195 pesos divided by the pr price of a, of a Big Mac, which is 49 pesos, right? I'm in Mexico, remember? We danced across the border in Laredo, and now we're sitting in Mexico. And so I'm going to take 49 pesos for every Big Mac. Here's that notation again. 49 pesos for every Big Mac. And how many Big Macs am I going to leave McDonald's with? 44.7. So I'm going to get 44.7, and then here's our math exercise. We got the denominator has the fraction now. We flip it over, multiply it times the numerator. The pesos cancel, and that gives now 44.7 Big Macs. All right, we're almost there. Now how do we make some money? What, what's our next step? Step number three. Go back to the U.S. with our big suitcase full of Big Macs, right? So we've got 44.7 Big Macs. We're going to dance back across the border. Probably stand outside in America, the Laredo McDonald's. We're just going to park ourselves right in that enter sign, you know, where it says enter into the Golden Arches. We're going to just stand right there and say, Big Macs for sale. Hey, I can get it to you fresh right now, just fresh from a 100-mile trip from Laredo or something. I don't know. So we got some sort of warmer, but we're going to sell those suckers, assuming that we can... Hold them. So number three is to sell the Big Macs in the United States at the market price. So now I've got 44.7 Big Macs, and I'm going to sell them for how much? 
five dollars and six cents the market price we're not going to get into uh, i have to undercut mcdonald's and you know we're just going to say that this is the market price that i can dump those babies for five dollars and six cents so we got five dollars and six dollars per big mac there's our notation again and how much dollars am i left with 226.5 uh, 20? 1 8. So I got, again, the Big Macs cancels with the Big Macs, and this is $226. How's that for a profit? Not too bad, right? I started with $100, and again, if I'm in a uh, a costless form of transportation of some sort or very low transaction costs, I should be doing this all day long. I should start buying Big Macs and I'm going to be a millionaire in no time if I have to put up $100, run across the border, make 226 and then of course I roll the dice again. I go back to Mexico with my 226 Go to McDonald's, load up even more, bring them back across the border, right? I, I can make a million bucks depending on how quickly I can go do these transactions. If we're really talking about Wall Street and a global economy, does that take very long? No, that gap's gonna close like this, right? So this Big Mac story kind of helps motivate things, but we got the same things going on in the global financial markets, that those gaps are going to close quickly when we see that their purchasing power parity is not being kept in check. Okay. Questions on that? Got the idea of arbitrage? You guys all ready to be, become currency traders now? That's what these big walls, some of these big Wall Street places do is they do big time currency trading all day long. All right. Um, so we need to do some accounting of this next. How do countries keep track of this junk? Um, oh, I wanted to show you one other thing. I forgot because it wasn't highlighting. Look at how the graph morphs. Watch this graph. When I drag this over Mexico, then this shows what it's done since 2000, 07, 08, 16. So this is from 1999. Big Macs have been cheaper in the United or in Mexico relative to the United States. And so you can start picking any of these countries. There's Peru. Let me go back up to the Canada since we got a I guess I can do that on the graph. So you guys went the Big Mac was cheaper, then it got a little more expensive, and then we've had a little issue with currency going not, not getting quite as good a deal anymore, right? So now all of a sudden we can go across the border uh, to our Canadian McDonald's and get them a little, little cheaper. Okay. Um, <coughs> yeah, when you got uh, when you got people here with connections, you guys could FedEx that thing right over. <laughs> have your mom and dad buy it and tell them not to ask questions. Just send it. My economics professor wants a Big Mac for class on Wednesday and see what happens. <laughs> All right. Um, All right, so So there's a lot to keep track of with international flows of goods and services and, and frankly the accounting of it isn't always perfect and it's, it's uh, sometimes challenging to do, um, but it's necessary uh, for um, looking at how much money is being held within banks and other places uh, with foreign currency. So this little thing I like to call international accounting. I'll try not to make it too, too boring, but uh, basically each country keeps track of its payments. 
each country keeps track of payments to and from other countries. And that gives us these three balance of payments accounts. Three balance of payments accounts, kind of a weird word, but <coughs> All right, so our first one is what we did at the beginning of the class, first, first module, and that was the current account. So one of these payments is called the current account, and it keeps track of, the current account keeps track of the value of <coughs> exports. <coughs> and the accounting of it is going to be our net exports. So this is tied into our cigarettes. So we've got the economy as C plus I plus G plus X. Remember that X was net exports. Exports minus imports. For this chapter, we're going to add a little bit more detail, but that's basically what the current account is, is net exports. So the current account keeps track of the value, the dollar value of our exports minus the value of our imports. Minus net interest paid. We'll write these out and then we'll talk about them. Minus net transfers. And at the end of the day, when we subtract all of these numbers from the value of our exports, we get the current account balance. Whatever that number is, is our current account balance. All right, so this, this is just net exports that we did before from our cigarettes. And then we've got net interest paid. So it's interest that Americans paid to foreigners minus what foreigners paid to us. So this is interest on financial assets. So net interest paid is uh, interest to us minus interest from us or paid to row. And net transfers is what we give minus what they give us. So a transfer payment, we give it as foreign aid, for instance. What we've learned to be, proved to be pretty much a disaster to send millions of dollars over to Africa to help feed the, to help feed the hungry, because it turns out the hungry is not getting really fed a lot of times. It's not a very effective way to reduce poverty. But, so the U.S. is on this side, right? This, this side's usually positive. We give more money to the rest of the world compared to what the rest of the world gives us back. But there is that uh, netting effect. So we have a positive uh, number here in terms of the United States, and then we've got interest paid on balances. We subtract all those and we get our current account. All right, questions on that one? So what is that number for the United States? Is this a positive number or a negative number? So exports and imports, I'll tell you, are the largest volume. These end up being relatively small, pretty tiny, so you can almost kind of ignore these. 
So does this end up being a negative number or positive number? Positive, negative? I heard a positive and a negative. So let's see, do we import more from the rest of the world or do we export more to the rest of the world? We import, yes. So that was one of the things we learned from the international trade chapter, the uh, module one, is that in the United States, we tend to buy more Chinese plastic stuff than what we sell to China in chopsticks, right? So they buy $100 worth of chopsticks and we buy probably $500 worth of plastic toys and that makes this a negative number, okay? So this overall for the United States is negative. It's what we call the trade deficit. So for the United States, the other buzzword that we have is the trade deficit for the United States. And this has been a hot potato for the election with these kind of more protectionist policies that Trump's been throwing around and that he's going to be negotiating better deals for us with uh, China. It's funny at the supermarket yesterday, I was at the grocery store and uh, oh, it was tomatoes. So I go to the, to the produce area and it was my wife and I shopping and I go up and uh, there's these huge softball sized tomatoes, you know, right there. And I like putting a tomato on my sandwich. So I grabbed the tomatoes and my wife was probably 10 feet away. And I'm like, please, Mr. Trump, don't take away my tomatoes. Because you looked on the side and these were, you know, made in Mexico. That's, that's why we're having low priced, good, juicy tomatoes is due to the United States trade with Mexico. Avocados are even higher on the list of why we're able to enjoy. You guys know the health benefits of avocados? I know I got lots of health nuts, even if I, you guys don't follow, uh, uh, follow all the economics behind it. But uh, if you're an athlete, um, you might want to try some avocados. They're really good for you. I don't, my wife really likes them. I like uh, guacamole dip, so as long as I'm eating them with chips and salsa and other stuff. But uh, if some people just like, I think you either like avocados or you don't like avocados because you can just eat them right from the, from the fruit. But in the United States, this time of year, you usually couldn't get avocados or they'd be really expensive. Now we've got cheap avocados, cheap tomatoes, cheap strawberries. I mean, we've got low, um, fairly inexpensive produce that helps make Americans healthy. I haven't heard this angle on the, on the policy trail, but um, if Trump screws up some of that, not only would there be monetary issues, but I'd like to argue maybe from a health standpoint, right? If berries are cheap and avocados are cheap and other vegetables are cheap, what does the law of demand say? Are we going to buy more or less of them? More. So if we're going to be using healthy substitutes for food because of our free trade or relatively free trade with places like Mexico. So not only would we uh, lose um, income in terms of net benefit and the things that we talked about with free trade, but maybe we'd also continue to be a little not so healthy because now all of a sudden if the price of the bag of potato chips stays constant and tomato and avocado and strawberries and blackberries and these prices start going up, we start to grab the bag of chips a little bit more often than we should compared to when berry prices were cheap, right? So, you might have a health thing. I hadn't thought about that, so this class, this moment, that, uh, that might be another angle. I might have to write Mr. Trump and see if, uh, see if he gives a damn about what I say. Okay, um, where was I? I got kind of carried away with avocados and strawberries. So, the capital account, number two. The capital account keeps track of keeps track of foreign investment in the United States. So foreign investment in the United States. Minus U.S. 
investment. Abroad or in the rest of the world. <coughs> Plus a statistical discrepancy. Equals the capital account balance. And uh, let me double check to, I might call this the financial account, or capital and financial account. I have a little note down, I can't remember if that's. <coughs> capital and financial account. So add that onto here, capital and financial account. All right. So um, who owes who money if we bought more from China than what we sold them? Who owes who money? Does the U.S. owe China money, or does China owe the U.S. money if we bought more chop, we bought more plastic toys, we bought $500 worth of plastic toys, they only bought $100 of chopsticks from us? Who owes who money? The U.S. owes China, right? So you have to have like a credit card or something. Well, it doesn't quite work like that. Uh, it kind of works like that. You know, what does the credit card mean? Well, ultimately, after the dust settles in the financial markets, China ends up buying U.S. assets. So like government T-bills is one of the most popular things. So if the U.S. owes money, instead of getting cash for all of the stuff, they end up buying U.S. government bonds because these are pretty safe. In terms of the global economy, the U.S. hasn't defaulted on these things. So the Chinese don't mind holding on to these. And so when Obama or Trump signs their name to this thing, they haven't ever defaulted. Like, they're going to get their money eventually. So that's how this borrowing kind of goes on globally is that other countries, when the U.S. owes them money, this is their marker, right? This is essentially their IOU, just like we had. If we do it at a very micro level, we can kind of think of, of uh, the American company having to give them an IOU because we didn't pay them cash, right? We were short on what we owed them. But this is at the country level. What really goes on is they end up accepting a government bond as the IOU. So now they're holding on to that a uh, piece of paper and they just eventually get paid down the road, right? So that's our capital account balance is foreign Chinese investment in the United States is actually owning and holding on to these government bonds. They own quite a bit of that. Minus what Americans bought. So Americans could have a German bond, for instance. So they have a, a government bond denoted uh, or that Ger the government of Germany sold, similar to this. So we're going to subtract those two things out. So what we're really measuring is our chapter, whatever, our global, our global marketplace for supply of loanable funds and demand for loanable funds. We're kind of measuring that here in the foreign exchange markets. And so <clears throat> if the U.S. runs a deficit here, if this is negative, this has to be positive. So foreigners have loaned us money to fund this trade deficit, which can be a good thing that we have. And this can take place of foreign ownership of U.S. assets as well. So we can start to look at, at real estate and other uh, holdings of assets. <coughs> Okay, questions or comments on that? 
All right, so lastly, we have the official settlements account. So number three is the official, official settlements account. And it keeps track of foreign government, foreign government holdings of U.S. currency. <clears throat> this is like cash. Foreign government holdings of U.S. currency minus our central bank, the U.S. government's holdings of foreign currency. So how many dollars is Zimbabwe holding minus how much the U.S. is holding of foreign currencies? We subtract those two things and we get the official settlements balance. All right, so this is an accounting exercise. What's one of the early things we learned in accounting about debits and credits? I'll have to be equal, debits equal credits, right? It's accounting exercise. So one side of the balance sheet's gotta equal the other. So that's why we call, I call this international accounting, is that at the end of the day, this plus this plus this all have to equal zero. So the sum of the three accounts has to equal zero. So key point, the three balances must sum to zero. Parentheses, debits equal credits for international accounting. And as we stated, the United States is a net borrower. So the USA is a net borrower. A net borrower because of the current account deficit. Now, that implies, though, that they have a capital account surplus, which never gets talked about. So that implies capital account surplus. Woohoo! We got a plus over there. We also refer to the United States as a debtor nation. So the USA is a debtor. We are in debt, a debtor nation. That's kind of depressing. We're considered a debtor nation since uh, net borrowing exceeded net lending, since historically we've piled up debt. Since historically net borrowing exceeded net lending. So the question that gets asked all the time is, should we be alarmed about this? Is it bad to be a debtor nation? I mean, it makes us like we're some sort of poor country, um, or is it, is it good? 
I mean, in some ways, it's kind of a sign of prosperity that you can be extended some credit, that you're a value that uh, China wants to invest in the United States. I mean, then you can kind of put a positive spin on it. Um, and, and that's actually true. I, I don't have any problem with the trade deficit per se. Um, some people ask, and, and this is, I think, where some of the Trump people maybe go wrong. I, I still haven't figured out if Trump actually goes wrong with this or not. But some people look at this and say, we need to flip this around. This is, this is bad. You know, if trade, if free trade caused this, we're sucking American jobs away, blah, 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 blah. What they're missing the boat on is that it causes a reallocation of resources in the United States that causes other industries to emerge, right? So the whole, what are we good at? We go back to Tom and Jen on the island, uh, Japan and the United States with cars. What are we best at, right? And so ultimately, if we create additional income, it's possible that the industries that emerge in the United States end up producing goods that are purchased by Americans. So the income is still there, even if a trade deficit persists. So that's something that takes a little bit more economic insight to, uh, to get that the average media person certainly uh, that doesn't give them the glamour headlines to, to splash up. So, all right, we'll call it a day there. So Wednesday test, I'll send out Wednesday in class midterm, and I'll send out the other stuff. Okay, signature without a grade. Just sign it to say that you've been here or what? Okay. Uh, 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 yeah, I think I did that before. So, uh, the hard thing is people understanding what an equation sheet is, that it's really just equations only. So, yeah, uh, why don't you send me an email on that? So I'll, I'll kind of remember to, I'll send something out to the whole class on it. Okay?